Yes, Your Honor. Will that what we bring in? Yes, Judge. It's a matter that we discussed outside. We took up with Your Honor when it happened. The jury was here. We didn't want to delay the proceedings. Your Honor indicated we could put the comments on the record today. Uh, it relates to at one point during the course of the proceedings, Your Honor said, and I don't have the quote exactly, but something to the effect of, I think we were objecting to doing something for the record, and Your Honor mentioned when this case gets to the Supreme Court. Yes, we would respectfully object and move from this trial. And we've discussed it off the record. I think Your Honor is prepared to rule on that. Yes, sir. No Thank you, Judge. I'll go to two other questions. One Judge, one is. Uh, some remark by the state, Mr. Gamora. Yes, sir. And actually, Ms. Ms. Jenkins or Mr. Miller were closer uh, to Mr. Gamora was by the jury. And Your Honor, I just wanted to make make the record clear. I'm not sure the court reporter picked up on what was said. Court reporter will not inquire any your the reason I say that, Your Honor, is that an attorney calling a juror in the middle of the proceeding puts, is a procedure that I have not had any relation with. I don't know if any rule covers it. I know there are provisions by which the court can make it But There's also provisions that the court does that they can be in reverse. I don't intend to be substantial in that barrel. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying, Judge. What I'm, what I'm saying is it's... As an attorney, you call the jury, ask the jury questions, and then you put the juror back in the jury box. That puts counsel in a very difficult position. And I court likewise. That's where you tell them to get the truth. I would say to you, if you want to go on a fish, have some basis for your statement, but that's all I can say. What's, it's not that, Your Honor. I'm going to stay away from it. Your Honor, may I respectfully suggest something? Yes, sir. I likewise like, like Mr. Knowles because he and I are sitting in our relative position. I did hear the remark. I did hear the objection. Your Honor did instruct, uh, I think, a request that Mr. Moore be punished. And I think, Your Honor, my, my best recollection said, let's clean it up or something like that. Which is correct. Which is yes, exactly. in fact was an admonishment. I were taking this admonishment. If anything, uh, if anyone was uh, perhaps prejudiced by that one sequence, it would be the state. Uh, the closest thing to an admonishment that I've heard in the courtroom that was uh, well received and uh, nothing even similar has occurred since then. I, uh, what I'm saying is I don't believe there's been any prejudice to the juror or jury. That would be the uh, issue. All the defense counsel the court on losing to the I, I guess the alternative, Your Honor, would be for Your Honor to instruct the jury that any non, any comments made that are not part of the proceedings, anything they may hear mumbled under close presence. Yes, Judge. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Thank you, Your Honor. There are um, a couple of other matters I need to talk to Mr. Tanner about with regard to scheduling. Probably the best thing to do, John, is to follow this. Right? You told me Friday you want to make uh, a objection about records and hearing on similar facts according to my I'm ready to hear that. Yes, Your Honor. We've, as some of the witnesses testified, we recognize that reports from some of the witnesses, one obvious example is the report, the, the synopsis that uh, Detective Forzeppo was using. Uh, were not had not been previously provided to the defense. There were certain other Richardson related issues that we brought up. We objected to those, Your Honor, denied the objection. Um, that has been unsuccessful, and our inquiry is a very simple one. If the state has knowledge of the current address and telephone number for Jacqueline Davis, in addition, whatever address and phone number was provided by Jeff Davis, we would request that those be provided to us at this juncture. We'll do that, John. All right. Anything else? That's it for now. Uh, excuse me, Your Honor. Can we still have our continuing objection as to the uh, the introduction of the Williams rule and additionally the, the statements. Okay, I just can't. Because we're starting a new week. Ongoing objection. Photograph number 76 is an aerial photograph of the scene where the body was found. There are crime scene vehicles in the photograph. There's also a blue blanket present which was placed over the body by the police present. Photograph 77 is the general area in which the body is, was found. However, I cannot see the body in this photograph. 
and photograph 78 is a photograph of the area where the body itself was found. Off to the left in the picture is the blue plastic blanket-like material which the sheriff's office had placed over the body. Uh, on top of the body itself, there are uh, uprooted long stalks of grass, and there is also some greenish-blue material which we subsequently identified as an electric blanket. Doctor, would you please uh, describe your autopsy findings or procedures and your findings? This was an extremely decomposing body, and those normal processes we perform, such as eye color, height, and weight, could not be performed because of the decomposition. Following the taking of photographs, the body was x-rayed, and the internal examination was then performed. Portions of some organs of the body could be identified, but the majority of the organs were no longer identifiable. We were able to locate by x-ray and subsequently at autopsy a total of nine lead bullets. One was embedded and fragmented in the inner part of the left upper arm along the bone called the humerus. The other eight bullets were located in the region of the lower chest and upper abdomen. It was impossible to trace any paths of bullets. Because of the decomposition and the in insect activity present, openings in the skin had been created that could not be identified as to insect activity or bullet holes. There were two injuries in the left upper abdomen, which I believed were probably bullet wounds. Doctor, I'd like you to objection to probably unless it's to a reasonable degree of certainty, Your Honor. Yeah, right. you like that. I do, Your Honor. I'd like you. I'm sorry. On that point. No, I would go back to it. No. Right. Doctor, when you say probably, you mean within a reasonable degree of medical probability? Yes, I do. With trial. Right. I'd like you to look at Exhibit Five K for identification. Don't turn that around, just keep it to yourself, please. Uh, can you tell the jury, please, what that photograph represents? This is a photograph taken in the autopsy room at my office of the abdomen, chest, head, and left arm region of the man that was ultimately identified as Car Charles Karskadden. Does that photograph also uh, depict the uh, areas of the body and the wounds which you indicated within a medical, reasonable degree of medical probability uh, were bullet wounds, entrance wounds? Yes. John, please read off the photograph of uh, the evidence. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Doctor, prior to coming here to testify, you reviewed your report, did you not? Yes. Could you testify in this case if you did not have this photograph? Yes. Then we would renew the previous objections. We Would you continue, please, Doctor, with the uh, your findings, you, you indicated uh, having located the bullets, uh, did, uh, what did you do next? I removed the eight bullets that I found, uh, one between two ribs, two in the region of the diaphragm, the muscle that separates the organs of the chest from the organs of the abdomen, two in the region of the aorta, which is the main artery of the body running along the backbone, two from the region of the liver, one from the supporting tissues of the large bowel, one from the region of the right kidney. I placed those eight bullets, which were of similar appearance, 
into an envelope labeled with the case number and the date and placed my initials on it. I did the same thing with the fragments of bullet from the left arm, but they were placed separately. Doctor, I'd like you to examine <coughs> Exhibit 5L. Cause of death of Charles Karskaden was multiple gunshot wounds to the chest and abdomen. Were any efforts uh, made to to uh, create, recreate, perhaps what Mr. Karskaden's countenance, his face, would look like? Yes. Objection, relevance, Your Honor. I'm going to try this in. Try it out. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes. It may not, may not be essential to where we are at this point. Your Honor, we will not uh, ask any further questions about the instruction. <coughs> To your knowledge, in connection uh, with the identification and the remains that were available, uh, were efforts made to identify the, the deceased car's cabinet visually? In other words, was something done to try to, to uh, identify him uh, short of a scientific analysis, perhaps a DNA or something like that? There were multiple efforts made. Uh, ultimately, did you participate in or observe uh, any, any identification being made? I did not observe the identification being made, no. Have you had occasion to uh, observe Have you seen in, in the past uh, a photograph of this car's cabin represented by Exhibit 83? Yes, I have. To your knowledge, was a likeness of this car's cabin uh, scientifically created to assist in identification? Objection, relevancy, Your Honor. Yes, one was created. We had another question, Your Honor. Thank you. May I or Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Dr. Wood, how are you, ma'am? Fine, thank you. My name is Billy Nobles, and I'm one of the attorneys representing Ms. Warnes. During your examination in this case, were you able to conclude anything about the sequence of the bullet shots? Gotcha. No, the body was too decomposed for that to be done. Were you able to, con to reach any conclusions as to the range of the gunshots? No, again, the body was too decomposed for that type of testing. You cannot tell us how far the decedent was from whoever it was that shot him. No, I cannot. And you cannot tell us which shot came first, second, third, so on and so forth? No, I cannot. Were you able to determine anything as to whether the decedent and whoever it was that shot him were standing or sitting? No, I cannot. Were you able to determine anything as to whether the decedent was moving or not at the time of the shooting? I can tell you that the bullets are relatively closely grouped. Uh, it's relatively accurate shooting. Um, there has not been a great deal of movement on the part of this individual, but I cannot say whether he moved or did not move at all. So you do not know if he was moving towards the person who shot him or anything with that regard? No, I do not. And you indicated you could not trace the paths of the bullets? No, I could not. So you, all that you know is that they were in relatively close range. 
they were closely spaced to one another. They were from front to back. That's all I can say. And that was around the abdomen area? Lower chest, upper abdomen, with the exception of one that hit the left inner arm, upper arm. Were you able to conclude whether the decedent was standing above or below the person who shot? No. Were you able to conclude anything regarding where the shooting took place? It is, my, it is my opinion that the shooting did not occur where the body was found. That is the only statement I can make, however. Were you able to conclude anything as to how the shooting occurred? As to the circumstances of it? No. Did you have any information about what may have occurred before the shooting happened? No. Were you yourself involved in evidence gathering in this case? Yes. Did you point out items of evidence for the investigators when you were at the scene to take for processing? I requested that the investigators go over the area where the body was found with a medical detector after I left the scene. I did not remain there while that was done. Any other items that you may have pointed out to the investigators? No, I stayed in the immediate area of the body itself, and I did not search the area. Otherwise, that was their job to do. Any items that were around the body that the investigators may have pointed out to you that you're aware of? The only objects I recall are the body itself, two teeth, and the electric blanket, and the grass. During your examination, you did, uh, you did not uncover any evidence that the decedent had been shot in the face, did you? No, there was no evidence of that. The head was x-rayed. There was no evidence of any metal consistent with the bullet in the region of the head. So no head wounds at all? No. You prepared a pretty thorough report in this case relating your involvement in it, your discussion with uh, some of the investigators involved. Do you have that report with you? I have my report. The autopsy report is, of course, quite short because of the limited nature of what could be done, but I have it, yes. But you did include other pages regarding your contact with investigators and so on and so forth, information relevant to your involvement in the case. Yes, I have all my investigative notes. During your interaction, during your involvement in this case, did you become aware of Investigator Muck speaking to the decedent's mother? I, I'm sure that I did, but I would like to check my answer. Sure. sure. <laughs> Yes, we were called on December 12, 1990 at 9.19 in the morning. Did you become aware of information relating that the decedent had a 45? I do not have that information, no. You indicated he had not been shot with a 45. That is correct. During your, relation, during your involvement in the case, did you also become aware of information that law enforcement was looking for a homosexual killer? No, I was never told that. Could you, do you have your report with you? Yes. Could you turn to page two? Paragraph two, second sentence. Just read that to yourself. Two. That is a phone call from Detective Muck to one of my investigators, and that sentence is present. Detective Muck indicated to you that law enforcement was considering <laughs> the issue of a homosexual killer. Yes, they may have a homosexual killer. During your involvement in the case, did any of those law enforcement officers relate to you why they thought Mr. Perscatton may have been involved in a homosexual killer type situation? Not that I recall, no. I have nothing to Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Wood, uh, you've had occasion to investigate homicides in which uh, homosexuals have killed someone, haven't you? Yes, many times. Uh, 
in your experience as a forensic pathologist, uh, is it unusual to find that that uh, personal deviant uh, sexual preferences may kill in a rage and inflict multiple wounds upon the victim? That is common. With regard to the uh, bullet wounds and the various orders, Your Honor, may Mr. DeMore step forward again? Sorry. Mr. DeMore, may he remove his coat, Your Honor? Yes. May the doctor step down? Yes, sir. Doctor, would you, if you would, uh, using Mr. DeMore as a demonstrable uh, object, uh, mark on Mr. DeMore uh, the areas in which the wounds that you could identify were found, and the either the quadrants or the height within the body uh, the, the bullet were found. The two probable bullet holes that I was able to identify were both in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. They were separated from each other by one inch, and one lay directly one inch above the other. They were to the left of the midline and above the umbilicus, so they would be in this general region one inch apart. There was a five by six inch area of absence of skin in the region of the left chest, consistent with insect activity. There were also a multiple areas of injury to the skin in the region of the left chest and the left upper abdomen that I could not state as to whether they were bullets, holes, or whether they were insect injuries. So all of the, the bullets uh, that you recovered were located between where and where? They were located from the level approximately here to here, being um, the region of the diaphragm or the muscle that separates the organs of the chest and the abdomen, the liver, the midline, the kidney, the region of the large bowel, um, one in the back between the eighth and ninth ribs, which is down low in the back, and then one in the left arm. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Moore, turn your seat in the doctor as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Cool. Mr. Novus asked you if you could tell uh, what attitude the body was in when the uh, bullets were fired, correct? Yes. And you can't tell, tell the jury whether the deceased was standing up when he was shot, sitting down. Is that correct? No, I cannot. In fact, he could have been flat on his back when some of the shots were delivered, couldn't he? Yes. Do you know which bullet was fired by the assailant first? No, I do not. Do you know which bullet was fired second? No, I do not. Do you know which bullet was fired third? No, I do not. Fourth? No. Right on through ninth? No, the body was too decomposed for me to tell uh, anything about the order in which the gunshots were fired. There's no question he was shot nine times, is there? There's absolutely no question. Thank you, Ron. Doctor, you were able to determine, you indicated, from the location of the shots that they were fired quickly. Oh, objection, Your Honor. Uh, I'm sorry, I won't draw the objection. That's not what I said. What I said was that the bullets struck in a relatively limited area of the body. And what does that tell you? That tells me that there was not a great deal of movement between the shooter and the victim during the shooting, uh, and that they were essentially facing one another. But it doesn't allow me to tell their relative exact position. From your examination, you did not determine the distance between the person who pulled the trigger and the deceiver, did you? No, the kinds of tests that we can normally do were totally prohibited by the amount of decomposition. Nothing further. Thank you, Doctor. Any further? Yeah. Just one more get on you.
May I ask one more question, Your Honor? Sir? Were you present when the fingerprints were rolled in Mr. Park's head? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, would you tell us your full name, please? Stephen Peter Sims. And Mr. Sims, how old are you? I am 24 years old. And can you tell us who your father is, sir? Peter Sims. All right, sir. Mr. Sims, when is the last time that you saw your father? That would have been April of 1989. Or, no, 1990. And where were you living at that time? Arkansas. Okay, and do you have an occupation? Yes, I'm a mechanical engineer. And did your father have an occupation? He was retired, sir. Okay, and what profession was he in prior to his retirement? He was a merchant marine. Did there come a point in time when he developed any other type of working arrangements? Mostly he worked either part-time with the church or some other missions organization. What would he do with the church or the missions? Tie it in, Your Honor. Yes, sir. He would either help out with transporting people to and from the church or help out around the church, like with landscaping, stuff like that. Sir, do you have a maternal or paternal grandmother? Yes, I do. Where does she live? She lives in West Milford, New Jersey. Now, can you tell, if you could go back in mind to the month of June 1990, were you anticipating seeing your father during the month of June? Yes, I was. Could you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how you and why you were expecting to see him? He was going to be taking a trip from Florida to New Jersey to visit his mother or my grandmother. And after that, for staying a week there, he was going to spend a week with me. He was going to take from New Jersey, he was going to go to Arkansas and visit me. Did your father make that trip, to your knowledge? No, he didn't. Did he ever arrive at your location or your grandmother's? No, he did not. Did your father write to you and tell you of his travel plans? Yes, he did. Did he indicate to you that he was planning on leaving Jupiter on June 7th of 1990? Sir, can you tell us when you were expecting your father to leave the Florida area heading to visit his mother or grandmother? It would have been around the 7th to 9th of June. And did your father indicate to you, as was his practice, how he would let you know when he had arrived or if he had arrived? Objection, Your Honor. Leading improper form. I'll be frank, Your Honor. Mr. Sims, did your father make any arrangements with you as to how he would let the family know when and if he would arrive? He was supposed to call me when he was going to leave New Jersey to go to Arkansas. Did you ever receive that call? No, I didn't. Was your father the type of man that would have just negligently failed to call you? No, he was not. Was your father in the habit of disappointing you if you expected a telephone call? Your Honor, objection. Now, sir, were you familiar with any of your father's personal property? Yes, I was. Were you familiar with any type of luggage he might carry? Yes, sir. And were you familiar with his automobile? Yes. Were you familiar to the extent of knowing his automobile to know what his license tag was? Yes, I do. Do you recall the number from your memory? Yes, it was a Florida Challenger plate. The letters were A, F, N, and the number 065. How is it you're able to remember those numbers? When we used to go on vacation, as when I was a small boy up to New Jersey, we used to stop at hotels, and he could never remember the license tag numbers, and he'd always have to come back out from the lobby or the office to get them off the car. And I would usually be tired at that point in the day when we went to the hotel, so I would usually go in with him, and I memorized the car tag just so we could hurry on and get to the room. So let me show you, if I may approach, Your Honor. Yes, sir. What has been introduced in evidence and identified previously as State 60 in evidence. And it compiles the exhibit 84A and 84B. And I ask you if you're able to recognize the automobile that is portrayed in those photographs. Yes, this is his car. Your father, Peterson? Yes, that's correct. Oh. 
Uh, sir, if I would, if you could please, can you describe for the jury the type of suitcases the father might have been traveling with? Uh, yes, uh, we basically shared luggage. Uh, it was a family uh, consortium of luggage, so we'd all usually either share the same luggage or use the same luggage. And I had a a blue bag, a blue suitcase with a brown trim of brown leather that went around the center of the bag. I remember that. Well, and there was, let, let me show you if I may what has been previously <laughs> marked as an exhibit states you for you in that location. I think you'll take a close look at this. You can cut those away from that. Yes, sir. So what I'd like to know is if you can identify this as your father's suitcase. I've been only describing her. No, 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 no. Yes, this is this is a suitcase. Thing. Suitcase you gave your father. Uh, yes, I, I've used this suitcase myself going to college. All right, you go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Let me show you so from previous he submitted an evidence that states four S's for identification. I ask you if you were able to recognize that bag. Uh, yes, I do. Now, whose bag is that? Sir? Uh, it was my father's. My my brother, I believe, gave it to him when he returned from a trip from somewhere. Let me show you, sir. Identification purposes at phase four hours and then for identification. Are you able to recognize this item? Uh, yes, sir. Can you tell me what brand it is? It's General Electric. Do you know uh, whose who's property it was? Uh, it was previously mine. I gave it to my father when I left for Arkansas. And when was that that you gave it to your dad? Uh, it would have been uh, early in 1990. Let me ask you this, sir. The set that you see in there, do you recognize that at all? Uh, no, I don't. You do recognize a radio cassette? Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, can you tell me if you followed any type of windbreaker type jacket? Yes, he had a light tan windbreaker. Let me show you, sir, what the previously marked for identification purposes of states quadruple T for identification. Yes, that, that was his. That was your father's? Mm -hmm. So let me also show you what the marked for identification purposes that states four P for identification. Let me ask you if you examine the bag and its contents and tell me if you're able to recognize either the bag or any of the contents of the uh, the bag is his. I have one similar to it. Uh, as to the contents, I can't be certain of anything in here of that I recognize. When you and your father and your Tash family went on vacation, is this a tote bag you took with us? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, how are you able to recognize this as his bag? Uh, because he and my, if you can, uh, he and my brother, they both, we were going on a trip and they both bought uh, a toiletry case for themselves and they were both the same kind and I have one just like it, so that's how I know it's his. <laughs> you ever had occasion to go through the contents of your dad's bag? Uh, yes, on several times when I was in the bathroom, I'd look for tweezers or fingernail clippers and stuff, so. But I, I don't recognize any of this, per se. So let me show you, sir, and ask you to examine what the mark that states four cues for identification. Be able to recognize that item. If I'm correct, these are, uh, he used to cut my hair, and these would be the scissors that he used to cut my hair with. Yeah, the record reflects, Your Honor, that state four Q for identification was removed previously and marked as an exhibit from the tote bag described by the witness. <clears throat> Did your father have any type of lighting equipment that he would carry in his automobile? Uh, usually he carried a flashlight in case of emergency. Can you, can you remember the color of it, sir? Uh, yes, it was yellow with a uh, black 
trim. Sir, let me show you what it marked for identification purposes. The photograph states 5G for identification. I ask you if you were able to recognize that. Yes, this was the flashlight that he would have carried. Where would he normally carry that flashlight? Uh, in the trunk of the car. When you fall from a child on trips, would he have uh, any reason to carry any type of reading materials with him? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, I suppose he'd carry his Bible with him or uh, any other literature I'm not sure of. Reserve argument, Your Honor. For later. Yes, sir. After your father left for that trip to your, to your home and your grandmother, you ever seen him again? Uh, no, I haven't. Anyone in your family, to your knowledge, ever heard from him again? Uh, no, sir. Your Honor, ask him that. How long had your father and mother been married at the time of his objection? How established judge do you relative? All right, sir. Gee, so how long has he been married? Uh, more than 25 years. In all those period of years, did you know your father ever to go off for periods of time where your mother or your family did not know where he was? Uh, no, sir. Can you, Can you describe the relationship between your family, your father, your mother, and your brothers, as to whether or not he would, I just finished the question. Go ahead, finish it. As to whether or not it would be his normal behavior simply to disappear? Objection, Your Honor. Just a moment. Yes, sir. Your Honor, please the court at this time state that all of the evidence submitted to the witness identified that that of his father, Peter Sims, has state the evidence in this cause. Counsel. Yes, Your Honor. We obviously have the running objection that we discussed. We also would object to the suitcase as not having been tied in at all. No testimony that's been heard here as to where that item was recovered. And until the state presents such evidence, that item is inadmissible. We all, Your Honor, we have a spot where we similarly, Your Honor, the contents uh, have also not been tied in by the state in any way whatsoever. Uh, of a small bag. And as to some of these items, we have not heard testimony, and either has the jury as to how and where they were recovered. And I think that's something that needs to be presented here before the evidence becomes admissible. Finally, we object on relevancy grounds to the evidence as a whole, and I would reserve the right to present to your Honor argument on that at a later, but not too much later. Your Honor, unless, unless my memory is gauging me, I've heard a large gentleman, Ward Schwab from FDLE identified each and every one of these exhibits in open court as having been found in the uh, Jack's Mini Warehouse. As to that, Your Honor, the state is not offering the contents of the suitcase. We're only offering the suitcase. All right, so take the items out outside the area of the jury and outside the side of the jury in a few moments. Go ahead. Okay, Your Honor, with the other contents, we were addressing the contents of the small bag, which is sitting right in front of the witness at this time. Uh, which he stated he could not identify. The um, uh, suitcase, the large suitcase, we would get through in its entirety. Yes. The tote bag and the other items. Uh, right. Previous objection, Tom. I understood that from the middle subject. All right. Yes, sir. The objection is overruled by content screens. And uh, I'll have to start with those and put them in another. Uh, uh, bag and working for identification to hide uh, the exhibit. Your Honor, since the scissors were identified by the witness and they were from the contents of the tote bag, they'd be accepted. Scissors will be in evidence. Over, over the previous exhibit? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I've got the character of this witness at this time. Your Honor, I have no question for this witness. Judge, may he remain just for a brief time? Sir. 